never know when to start, to be honest. Wait for the thumbs up or wait to go to six. Oh, good evening. I want to give you a huge welcome again to our service here at Lost Mouth Baptist Church, again, whether you're in the service here or whether you're online. It was wonderful this morning to feel a real buzz about the church again, wasn't it? People being able to shake hands, or some people shaking hands, and just being able to chat again and just catch up a bit more like what church should be. It was wonderful, and it's great to see you back here again this evening. Now, Rob, tonight, he's going to continue his studies in First John, and we're looking forward to that again this evening. Rob, this morning, was speaking on gifts, and I know one thing, one gift I don't have is singing, and I apologize this morning. It seems to be the techie team forgot to put off my mic at the singing this morning, so as Anna and Sophie led us in beautiful worship, there was my deep, dulcet tones in the background, so I apologize for that, so... I maybe said it before, it was many years ago in the Gospel Hall, I opened for someone, a guy, and he, he said, you opened the last time for me, and I says, I don't remember that. He says, well, I do. He said, I'll never forget it. I'm thinking, well, why did you not forget that? And I think it was my amazing prayer, or was it the way it opened? And he wanted to say it was a horrendous singing, he says, I've never <laughs> forgot it. So I know it's one, not one of my gifts, but we're glad that God has gifted uh, musicians here tonight, and we're very thankful for that. This morning, we also thought about the verse, God being the God of hope this morning. And it was a couple of weeks ago, I remember, it was Willem, he read from First Peter, reminding us that the Lord Jesus, he is our living hope. And tonight, I just want to quote one verse from Hebrews, Hebrews 6, verse 19. And this is what it says, this hope we have as an anchor to the soul, both sure and steadfast. What hope is this? If you read the context of the chapter, the hope is the Word of God. And that's what we're coming around again tonight, the absolute Word of God that cannot be shaken. And it's like an anchor to our souls. And anyone knows anything about an anchor, you don't put it down on the sand. In the shifting sands of this world, that's not where our anchor is. Our anchor is safely in the rock of ages. And the, the, the idea of that anchor, it actually goes into heaven itself. That's a, that secure place that can never, ever be moved. So tonight, that is our hope. And that's what we're going to look at tonight, the hope of the Word of God that encourages our hearts, strengthens our hearts, and makes that Word unmovable and unshakable. So let's open with a word of prayer. Father, again tonight we come into your presence and give you thanks again for the wonderful opportunity of being able to meet here. What a joy it is again just to meet with your people and again to be back to some sort of normality. How great it is just to be able to chat and just to catch up and just to be together as your people as you would want us to be. Again, today we want to give you thanks as we thought this morning, that you're an awesome God, you're a God of hope. And again, we've thought tonight, not only that, that the Lord Jesus, he is our living hope, that you raised him from the dead and he is our living hope. And what a joy it is to know that our hope is in him. But again, tonight we give you thanks that your word is also seen as our hope as well. It is an anchor to the soul. And we think of so many in our world today, their anchor, as it were, is in the shifting sands of this world, being blown to and fro. But tonight we give a thanks as your people. We have an anchor that is sure and steadfast, unmovable. And tonight, God, I really pray for those who are feeling tonight as though they are blown about in the storms of life and realize it's so easy sometimes to trust in you and to follow you when the sun is shining and it's all calm, but realize how difficult it can be sometimes still to follow and trust in you when the storms come. So tonight, I really pray for all who are struggling this evening in the darkness of the storm, that tonight, again, they'll just look to you and just trust in you and have their hope in you. You're the one that said, I will be with you when you go through deep waters. The Lord Jesus said himself, he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So tonight I pray, God, for each one who's in that dark place, that you would draw near and courage and strengthen them this evening. Pray tonight, God, you just bless us as we've gathered here. Just pray again for Rob as he opens your word tonight and speaks to us. We ask once more, God, that you would just speak through him this evening, speak into our lives. It is a living word that's sharper than any two-edged sword. And tonight I really pray, God, that you would just speak into all our hearts and all our lives. I want to pray again even for those tonight in Plymouth, those who lost their life, those whose lives have been lost in this past week, and 
those who are grieving through that tragedy that's happened. God, tonight I just ask that you would draw near to them. You not only are a God of hope, you're the God of all comfort. We really pray tonight that you would draw near to these grieving families, just give them the comfort and the strength that they need at this time. But God, tonight we just pray that you would draw near to us, bless us as we meet now, and as we sing your praise and open your word, we ask for a real sense of your presence and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, band. <laughs> uh, let's stand and sing. Um, we've got three songs, we've got a worship set for you, so please feel free to worship how you want to. You stand, sit, however you're comfortable. Um, i 
It's great to be together this evening again, and there was a real buzz this morning just around our time together, and uh, it's just great to be able to enjoy our worship with a little uh, less of the restrictions than we had on before. As Andrew said, we are continuing uh, our series through 1 John, looking at 1 John chapter 5, beginning our final chapter really as we come towards uh, the end of this lovely letter that I hope you have enjoyed uh, as much as I have. I suppose I get a particular... Uh, enjoyment with it, having to, getting to read my commentaries and getting to study on it day and night, but it's a bit easier, but it's been amazing really to see what one John has to say to us. Really a, a summary in some ways of the whole of First John would be how our relationship with God transforms everything. How really that, 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 that interaction we have with him has transformed every aspect of our life. And, and John really pulls no punches as he puts before us the areas of which he wants to see transformed. And we'll see some more of that uh, this week coming up. Last week we looked at uh, really this verse 18. It's a good summary of it. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Though each one of us might have once feared God because we realized that he was a holy God and we were rebellious and sinful, rebelling against God's uh, perfect commands over us. We feared that perfection. We feared the answer of standing before him and his holiness. But now that same holiness is our assurance that we have to hold on to, that because God is fair God, he's an unchanging God, he's a God who keeps his promises. We now know that because Christ has died in our place with that wrath, God will not come asking us twice for, for double payment for the sin. We know that we are forgiven. And so that same holiness is now our confession that Jesus is our security and that we can come before him. So uh, if you have your Bibles, please turn to 1 John chapter 5. If you've got the blue Bibles that are under your seat or in front of the seat in front of you, uh, you'll find that on page 1023, 1023. 1 John chapter 5 beginning at verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. 
Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Amen. God's word to us this evening. Let's pray together. Our Lord and gracious Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your word. We're thankful so much for particularly First John in this recent series that we've done, Lord. We're so thankful that these are not words that we would necessarily think of or, or that would be at the top of our mind as we think about what it means to really have our attitude transformed by knowing you, Lord, to see the world as you see it. And so we're so thankful for the practicality of John, for the call particularly for us to love you and to love each other, Lord. And we just pray that you would help us understand that as we unpack this next section together. In your precious name we do ask and pray. Amen. So we saw really last week this kind of repetitive part of John. He's getting towards the end. He's still repeating again in 1 John chapter 5. He wants us to love God. He wants us to love each other. He wants us to know that we have the Spirit within us and he wants us to obey his commands. That's kind of the four things that come through time and time again in 1 John. These are things that he actually gives as a sense of assurance to us. That as we do these things and as we see the world as he sees them, we have the assurance that God, eh, we are children of God. We have the assurance that God is living within us and in our lives and that real sense that he is with us. And so at a time when the church was shaken, if you remember that some people have left the church, they've come in, there's been a false teaching going on, people have left and they're shaken by the very core of their faith. And along comes John, the apostle, maybe the only, likely the only remaining apostle by this point. And he encourages the church to know that they are in the faith, to know that they have remained true in God. And he encourages them all the way through this letter. It begins in verse one. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Again, this is a reassurance that he's giving to them. That sense that if you are confessing and believe in your heart that Jesus has been born of God, that Jesus is the Christ, then you are reborn. The confession in the last chapter in verse 15 was that Jesus is the Son of God. And if you confess that, you abide in God. Again, John makes the same point, but he takes a different emphasis this point, wanting to really, really hit home to us, continue to repeat himself until we really begin to understand and grasp the emphasis that this time Jesus is the Christ, he is the Messiah, he is the anointed one, and he is born of God. Anyone who knows that Jesus is the Christ, he is the fulfillment of those promises made long ago, is born again. And he wants us to know that that rebirth isn't something that we can do ourselves. No babies can born themselves. You know, I actually had a, I think I've told you this before, but I actually had the experience of almost having to give birth to a, a, a child, is that a way of saying it? That sounds like I was pregnant, doesn't it? Um, a pregnant woman was in my car and the, the ambulance said, no, you're not dilating you know, badly enough. And a nurse phoned me and said, this baby's coming, get her to the, to the hospital. And I, I dropped her off and I left and I, I, I live about 10 minutes from the hospital. And before I got home, I got a phone call to say, the baby has been born. <laughs> and I was thinking, gosh, I said to her, you know, if you'd had that baby in my car, I'd never be able to look at you ever again. <laughs> Do you know? And I'd have to probably torch the car as well. And I really liked that <laughs> Mazda 3 that I had. I really liked it. So the reality is that, that you, there's no way of me saying to that baby, look, go, you're going to have to do this yourself because I'm not the kind of guy who's going to deliver a baby. So listen, baby, if you're in there, sort it out for yourself. And the illustration is really important because we can't be born ourselves either. It's not a thing that, that we have the faith that makes us believers, but that God gives us the faith. It's saying that, that God has revealed to us who Jesus really is. So just as last week, he reveals to us our very sin. He reveals to us how much we just stand before God and we have nothing to say for ourselves, but then shows us Jesus. Shows us, as Andrew this morning was pointing to remind us why we have this cross up here, is because it's our only hope, but it's everything that we need to have hope in. And so we can be assured that God has revealed to us that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is Christ. And because we know that, and because we take Jesus as our Lord and Savior, then we are born again. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And secondly, verse 1 tells us, everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. 
I'm not going to labor this point too much because we've looked at it already, uh, but he's about to reverse it and we'll spend more time maybe on that. But again, John is making the point that God dwells in our brothers and sisters. They too are also born of God, reborn. Slightly different emphasis this time. But this, all the same, he's saying to us, before he was saying to us the fact that God lives in them. So if God is invisible, how can we love those who God is in who are visible if we don't love the invisible? If we don't love the visible, pardon me. This time he's saying that they also are born of God. Something incredibly encouraging about this, that God shows them the same love that he's shown to you. Not nothing that we've done to achieve it. Nothing we've done to earn it. Nothing we've done to make ourselves lovable. So also the calling of the church is not to love the lovable people. That's not how God approaches us. We are to love everyone. And really that's something that John has hit really hard home in 1 John. More than I've ever noticed or focused on. And I've preached through 1 John before years ago. And I don't quite remember this being as stepping out to me, as standing out to me. The fact that time and time again he repeats and he repeats And he repeats to us this need we have. And then in verse 2, he reverses it. By this we know we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. Isn't that kind of an interesting way? The only, the, the love of your brothers and sisters is proven by your love of God and his commandments. Now you would say logically, the love of your brothers and sisters proves your love of God. But John is saying the love of God proves your love of your brothers and sisters. Feels a little bit like a riddle, doesn't it? What came first, the chicken or the egg? You know, and the answer to this, just so you know, it's actually God moved first because um, we're told we're able to love because God first loved us. John makes that point three or four times in this letter. So we can have that answer. But the point really that he's making is that the two have to exist together, hand by hand. One cannot exist without the other. One preacher really helpfully described it like a flower. He said, you can talk about the petals of the flower, or you can talk about the stalk of the flower, but you have to realize that all these sections make a flower. If you pull apart the petals or the leaves or the stem, you no longer have a flower, just a section of a flower. And this is really John's ultimate point. You can't have one and not the other. They must exist together, because to not have one is to prove you don't have the other. Did you know when we don't love our brothers and sisters, we're proving we don't have the love of God in our hearts? That's what John's saying. Have you ever thought of that before? If I'd said that without scripture, I don't think I would agree with myself. But that's what John is saying. He makes it so clear. He makes it so explicit. I've never quite noticed it in the same way. Maybe because you have to preach on it, you have to explain it. But it really stands out. That this is what John is saying. One cannot exist without the other. The the non-existence of one proves the non-existence of the other. The existence of one proves the existence of the other. They're like different parts of a flower that all together are one. You know, I've met a lot of people in my time who say to me things like, I love God, but I don't have any time for the church. I remember years ago, I met a guy who said that exact thing to me. He says, you know, I don't really go to church. I do my own thing. But me and God are solid. I've got a really good relationship with him. And I said, okay, interesting. Do you know the scriptures say, eh, let's not stop meeting together as some of the habit are doing? Looking at Hebrews. And he said, yeah, well, you know, the other thing is that I... I kind of follow the essence of Scripture, like I follow the points God's making. I don't follow it to the T. I'm not a legalist. Again, okay, it makes sense. To not have one proves that you're not going to have the other. This guy doesn't really have a living faith with God. And I said to him, do you know part of the problem there is that this is basically your own decision. You decide what God is acceptable to tell you to do, and you decide what isn't acceptable for God to ask you to do. Basically, you are your own God. There's no sense for you of coming under the submission of God. And so it plays out in his life in the fact that he had no time for the church. Maybe he'd been hurt by it. I can understand that. Maybe he'd had a a bad experience of the church, but he'd misunderstood that deep relationship between God and the church with it. 
The church is the people of God and the people are loved by God and God made them children of God. And if that isn't enough, then neither is the love of God enough for us. So let's ask the question, do you love the church? And I appreciate there might be some homework for us to work through. There might be some of us tonight or listening online who have been really hurt by the church. And you know, as far as I'm able, I want to say I'm sorry for all the times when church is hurt. Might be this one, might have been a different one. But listen to John. Listen to the heart of John who says, listen, if you're going to love God, you've got to take seriously the fact that you need to love the church as well. Because the church isn't the church on its own authority, on its own behavior, on its own ability. It's the church because God has called it with that same gospel love that he has called you and me to know him in our lives. From that, John continues to tell us that if we love God, we obey his commandments. Verse 3 says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Now, before we go any further, I want you to notice some important language. This is the love of God, John says, that we keep his commandments. To love God is to love all of God, to love his character, to love God for the love that he is, to love him for what he asks us to do, to love him for the truth that he reveals. That's really what a relationship is. It's a commitment to the person. You can tell someone that you love them, but if you don't care about what's important to them, then you don't really show any evidence of your love. And since God is perfect, we're called to love God enough to keep his commandments. And he continues this point, asking us really about what our attitude towards God and his commandments are. You might say that we are asking about our attitude toward God and his church. But now he wants to ask you about your attitude towards God's commandments. Do you find God's commandments burdensome? Remember that, that John's desire at the very beginning of 1 John was that we might know complete joy. He says we are writing these things to, so that our joy may be complete. And this is really the secret to complete joy that we have available to us in God. It's our attitude towards God and how a genuine relationship with him transforms all aspects of our lives. In this case, our relationship with God's commandments. We might say that before, that before perfect love casts out fear, we had a very negative view of God's commandments. We might have viewed them as a burden because God is asking us to do things that we have no interest in doing. Or we might view them as a burden that other people have to live by. Look at those poor Christians, some might say. They have to live a certain way because of their fear of punishment of an angry God. Of course, that might be a mistake that someone has. We might be doing God's commandments in the hope that, that God will like us and bless us. Today, people talk a lot about karma. It seems to become a popular language. You know, that's karma. You know, somebody does one thing and something bad happens to them. They call it karma. And the amount of people I, I meet these days who say they believe in karma. Um, but karma is a brutal thing, by the way. Karma basically means that everything that happens to you, you deserve. And yet people seem to sign up to it quite happily when, when there's atrocious things happening in this world that surely no one deserves. But anyway, so be it. But it's the very same concept. I do things to please God, that he might be nice to me and favor me. So they see it as a burden. It's a burden that they have to obey in order to, to get along, that God might tolerate them, or they might achieve their own aim and purpose in life. But that's not the case for those who have a genuine relationship with God. We don't obey God to make him love us. We obey God because he loves us. And that is a dramatic difference, isn't it? It's fair to say there are times when we miss this reality. This is a, a wrestle that happens in our lives. There are times when we do find God's commandments burdensome. It might be that we want to be able to be free to behave in any way that we want to. We might be able to want to, to go along with whatever our school friends or work colleagues are doing. We don't want to be burdened by God's commands to control our behavior. We don't want to keep healthy boundaries in our relationships or control how much we drink. There's certainly times eh, when my perspective has been warped and I've thought to myself, it's easy for them. They aren't a Christian. They can do whatever they like. Do you ever feel that way sometimes in your mind? 
When I was really young, I used to be so jealous. Isn't it so sad? This is a sad example of my youth, but when I was young, I was always jealous of people who had fantastic stories about how much they were a nutter and how many things they did in the world. And then they would have this little qualification at the end. I was before as a Christian. And I was thought, I became a Christian really early. I didn't get to any of these stories in my, in my time of, of wildness. One guy was telling me about, um, he, he was in Spain, working in Spain, and he told the person in the uh, nightclub that Madonna was coming and that he was a director and that Madonna was in a film that he was in. And they got put into the VIP section and they got all the champagne and all this kind of stuff. And they started playing all the Madonna songs, waiting for Madonna, because he said, oh, Madonna's coming. We're just getting ready for her coming. And so this guy who owned the nightclub kept playing Madonna songs and Madonna. When is he coming? I ah, just come in any moment now. And they got so scared because they'd have all this free champagne that they jumped the fence in the back of the nightclub and ran off and they forgot their shoes because they had to jump so much and it fell off in the fence. I remember looking at that story and thinking, what a great story. I wish I had a story like that. But at a young age, I became a Christian, so I never did any crazy things like that and other stories that probably can't be repeated. And you know, as I get older, I now think, praise the Lord, that I became a Christian when I was younger. There was a time when I thought it was a burden. There was a time when I looked at it and thought, oh, I wish I had a story like that guy. And now I look and think, do you know, if I had to choose between the stories, I'd choose my own. Because there was never a time when I was able to go down, and I know, a wretched sinner that I am, and even as a Christian, I'm a really good sinner, I could go like Olympic gold medals for sinning. And without God guiding me, without that sense of God in my life, who knows where my life would end up? And I look at it now and I think, amen. I'm so glad that that guy was able to have his story. Praise the Lord that grace was in his life. But thank you, Lord, that I was growing up in a home where I, where I saw Christianity explained to me and exampled to me. And at a very early age, I thought, this is for me. I was so fortunate. I have missed out in nothing. This is not a burden. This is life giving. There are probably moments of temptation. Yeah, and there's still temptation in my life today. I'm not up here with a perfect ability always. But can I tell you, when I'm tempted, I'm tempted when I take my eyes off God. What John's saying is that our attitude towards God determines the way that we view the church. And our attitude towards God determines the way we view the world. And if you're not loving the people in the church, then you need to look at your attitude with God. And if you're starting to see God's commands as burdensome, you need to consider your attitude with God. That is what John is calling out to us about. These are the things of the flesh that keep trying to creep back into our life. Those sinful temptations to tempt us away from God. Such temptations promise the world and deliver nothing. They tell us how exciting and fun it will be and it never is. It's cheap to offer us immediate pleasure or a carefree attitude, but it never turns into joy, and certainly nothing like complete joy. Leaving the commands of God is a bit like someone who sticks a, a stick of dynamite into a rock. It doesn't matter how many times you blow up that stick, it's never going to make anything except a mess. No one's ever stuck a, a dynamite stick into, into rock and, and exploded it, and it's been the statue of David there at the end of it doesn't matter if you blow up once or a million times. All it's going to make is rubble. All it's going to do is make a mess. Those who live lives away from God's command do not find any less burden. They find greater burdens upon them. God's commands are far from being a burden. They are life-giving. You know, you consider it this way. You hear Matthew 5 and you work through the Beatitudes and you are just sensing how weak you are before God. You've heard it said of old, this is Jesus speaking, you've heard it said of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Or you hear Jesus say, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And you look at those and you feel the burden of God's command. These are difficult things so hard to manage. They feel almost impossible. How can you avoid getting angry with your brother? 
How can your eyes uh, be looking away from any lustful intent, even thought entering into your heart? The answer is that so long as you see these commands as a burden, you're always going to be wrestling against them. You're always going to be seeing them as something you've got to obey, something you've just got to do instead of looking at it through God's eyes and seeing the beautiful life-giving commands that Jesus is giving. A life that doesn't allow a rift to follow us and ruin our relationships for the rest of our lives. But instead, to take unity so seriously that we're not even willing to get angry with our brothers and sisters. Or we deal with it when it's at that stage of becoming angry and not let it get worse down the line where it does turn into maybe fisticuffs or worse. A life that's so life-filled that we aren't willing to let our eyes hover over the beauty of another person and let our minds run into fantasy because we take purity in our relationships so seriously and we get to enjoy the real commitment of a relationship instead of the silly fantasies within our minds, deepening the trust in those relationships and those uncompromising commitments. Is that really a burden? Absolutely not. It is life giving. And look, these things are hard. We muck them up all the time. We make mistakes along them all the time. This is a, a wrestling aspect. But the reality is, so long as our attitude of God is warped, we're never going to see these as life-giving commands, as life-giving offers to us. And so we're invited in victory to become overcomers. Verse 4, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Our faith, remember, is that gift from God something that's given to us. Praise the Lord that we're not in a situation where we have to be perfect in our lives. Praise God that it's not the situation that once you deal with these things, once you uh, treat your brothers and sisters perfectly, then you can come back to the church. Once you start to obey his commands, then you can consider coming into the presence of God. Absolutely not. Let's remember what 1 John 2 says to us. We looked at this way at the beginning. I don't know how, how long ago we started this, but anyway, a long time ago, we were looking at chapter two. My ch little children, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. I would not be doing justice to First John if I said to you, if you're not obeying the commandments and you view it in any way as burdensome and you don't love your brothers and sisters totally, then you don't belong in the church and your attitude of God is wrong. I'd also be wrong not to say that we need to look at our attitude with God and get right with him. Turn back to that fact that we have the spirit in our lives. The, the fact that God's love for us transforms us and that we should be seeing the evidence of faith in our lives. But when we don't and when we make mistakes and we will make mistakes, we have an advocate. That legal term of Jesus who stands on our behalf and says, listen, I know this guy made a mistake but remember what I did, I died on the cross for these sins. And so it's paid in full. And there's no sense of God the Father saying, ah, that legal loophole. Instead, this is God the Father's plan to say absolutely hallelujah. Through faith, this person is accepted as my child of God. Let's be a people who focus on being overcomers, of taking that gift of faith as we saw this morning in Romans 12, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Be transformed by having your eyes focused on God and an attitude to him. Don't live an empty life that loves the world, but that is so empty and wasteful. Instead, see things through God's satisfied eyes. Come and live life to the fullest in all its beauty, in all its victory so that we might see the world as it truly is, lifeless and dark <clears throat> and empty. That's what it means to love God and to love his commands. Verse five declares, who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the son of God? If God has revealed to you that Jesus is the son of God, then you are already an overcomer. You're already a victor. God has already given you the victory because of what Jesus has done. That is what the gift of faith is. Overcoming is not trying harder, but leaning deeper into God. You are already a victor, 
an overcomer, a gold medalist, as far as it goes within your Christian faith. There's nothing that you've got to add, thank goodness. There's nothing that we can ruin with it because it's in Christ. But what are we going to do about that? How are we going to respond to that? Are we going to say to God, well, thanks for everything you've done, but actually I'm going to do whatever I want. Are we going to listen to John and say, listen, if we see God, if we know God, then we see the world as God does. Do you see God's commandments as a burden to you? Or do they bring you great joy? None of us will obey this law perfectly. That's what John is encouraging us to do. Our prayer, however, is to be overcomers, to be victors, to live in the victory that God has given to us, to see the world as God sees it, to not only see the church as God sees it, chosen and loved by God, but also to see the world as he does, to refuse to be lured into those empty promises of the flesh and instead to see God's commands are not a burden, but life-giving. And greatest of all, we get to respond to God with this as an act of worship, glorifying him in response to all that he has given to us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this word. We thank you that we are made overcomers, not in our own ability, not in our own strength, but Lord, through you, through the faith that you've given us through your son, Jesus Christ, to be our great advocate, to be the one who has overcome the things that we cannot overcome in our own strength, to be the victor in the place that on our own we were never going to be able to be victorious. But Lord, as we come to the end of 1 John in these next few weeks, as we hear John hammering home this desire for us to live in the fullness of God, to recognize the wonder that it is to love God, not in order that he loves us, but because he has already loved us, and to give our lives, as we saw this morning, as a a living sacrifice before you. Lord, I pray that we would see the world as you do, transformed by the renewing of our mind, that we wouldn't see your commands as a burden, but as life-giving. Lord, as a church, would you bring us united together, closer together, because we know that to love each other is evidence of the faith that we love you. To love your commands is to know that we love you. And Lord, we desire to be the people who have that assurance of faith because you have transformed every aspect of our life. We ask these things in your holy and your precious name because we are helpless to do it alone. But we know that with your help, Holy Spirit, we can do these things. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing. i
May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen.